Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm joined by my co-host, Yoni Mazur, and our guest today, Rick Mursky. Rick, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Doing very well, dear. Thank you so much for joining us. So everyone, Rick is the founder of Ecom Diversify, a leading diversification solution for e-commerce businesses. So Rick, we are going to learn all about you today. We're going to start with where you were born, what you were interested in growing up, where you went to school, and just walk through your professional stations where you are today with Ecom Diversify. So let's jump straight in. Where are you from? Wow. wow. All right. So uh, originally, I'm from uh, New York. Uh, Long Island is where I was born. Uh, lived in uh, Queens for most of my life uh, until I was about 21 years old. Um, uh, the area was actually called uh, Bell Harbor, uh, Rockaway, New York. Um, and uh, growing up, my parents, uh, we can go straight into the details, I guess. Growing up, uh, my parents were uh, uh, great people. You know, I love my, I love my parents. They're awesome. And um, my dad, uh, worked his life in civil service. He worked uh, for the city of New York, uh, various stations from you know low management to upper management. And my mom is a teacher, she's still a teacher. She hasn't mm. retired yet. My dad is retired, my mom is she still- She was a teacher for uh, the PA, PS schools, uh, public school system? No, here. no, no yeshivas. Um, she worked for- So private Jewish schools? Private Jewish schools, yeah. yeah. Well, Got it. Details. Gotcha. So uh, yeah. God. Talk about your saying. father. Yeah, on your father's side, you and Sandy. But what kind of what was he doing for the city of New York with these roles? Uh, a little it, bit about that. Was it more there on were the lots, lots education different side, roles. more on the no, side? no, 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 more on the uh, actually on the health side. He worked in the health department for most of the time that uh, I was young, and um, his his hobby was always writing. So in the spare time when he wasn't uh, working, which was uh, he was working all the time because he worked for the city, but um, he was uh, he was always writing. He was writing books. Uh, he actually has a couple of books that are published. If you look him up online, you can find him, Stuart W. Mursky. Uh, what kind of books? For, He'll be happy about that. Uh, he does historical fiction. Um, nice. He yeah. has a, a book called The uh, the King of Vinland Saga. You can take a look at that. The King of? The King of Vinland Saga. Vinland is very... an imaginary place? Okay. Vinland? No, Vinland actually exists. Vinland is, um, I believe it's in Greenland. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, interesting it's a story of it's a Viking novel. Anyway, uh, he'll nice. he'll just be happy that I plugged him. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy um, to plug him. It's okay. Uh, but um, all right. So, but was he still at service during COVID? By the way, no, no. So he had retired long before COVID, but he was in the health department during 9/11. Oh wow! So he was there. He was at Ground Zero all the time. Uh, I remember him very rarely being home during that uh, time of uh, our lives. Um, so yeah, I heard he that a, it took nine months just to turn off the fires that were, were, were kind of raging within the, the, the whole area there. It was a long all the time. Fuel, all the stuff, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy it was project. A long time. He had, uh, he had a radio, a walkie-talkie with him that he had to keep on 24-7 during that time. So we always heard all the things that were going on, you know, at the Ground Zero. But... Um, but yeah, that's that's my dad. And uh, my mom, like I said, is an English teacher. She's uh, taught English in various schools, girls' schools, boys' schools, um, mostly, like we said, in the Jewish uh, education schools. Um, and yeah, and, uh, I have two sisters, uh, two sisters. Uh, both are teachers, believe it or not. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, one, is, uh, one is also an English and social studies teacher. And one is an early education teacher. So I'm the only one who didn't follow in uh, in the teachings footsteps. Got it. By, also, by choice uh, or like, did you yeah, know that that wasn't for teachings, you? Or? No, teaching's not my thing. You know, even even like you know, working and, and even owning a company, I'm not the best when it comes to teaching people how to do what they need to do. But uh, we do our best. Gotcha. I got. It. But also growing up, like, what was your focus? Were you focused on sports? Uh, oh, I was life, definitely uh, not focused on book, sports. Uh, academic. <laughs> I was definitely I mean, not I mean, focused it like on you're into sports. You got, you got the hat. You got the shirt over there. That came much later. That came in high school. Um, but I was not into sports at all. I was not into academics at all. Uh, I started my life in a very small school. Uh, from the time I was in nursery until I was in fifth grade, I was in a school with maybe a hundred or 200 people, not even, it's probably way less. And, uh, you know, so that, that kind of got me used to this very small environment. 
And then, you know, once I left that school and moved up to, uh, you know, a normal size school with a, a much, much larger a hundred or a couple thousand, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of got lost and I, I never really recovered from it. So I was that I, I spent my days just uh, making it through school. But uh, did you, uh, I don't know, try to make money on the side uh, to buy yourself stuff yeah, or just yeah, uh, yeah, I nothing? A kid. And I, had a, I had a good upbringing, so I didn't really need money. Like I wasn't uh, clamoring to find ways to get money. Thank, thankfully, my parents were able to support us and always keep us uh, happy and, and enjoying my hobby when I was growing up was uh, video games. That was uh, that mm. was my big hobby. That's a sport uh, today. It's a recognized sport. So. Yeah, today uh, it now, is. Now, nowadays it is. Back <laughs> then it was more like, why are you wasting your time? But uh, no, I still I still love video games even today. Um, and so uh, that kind of kept me out of sports, kept me out of uh, all that stuff. Uh, I was a big TV watcher when I was a kid. You know, we all watched the cartoons. Um, Top three shows. Uh, Go ahead. No, from when I was a kid. Oh boy. Yeah, let's do a kid. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> okay Top three shows when I was a kid. Let's see. Was uh, Power Rangers. Loved uh -huh. Power Rangers. Oh, nice. Uh, I was a big fan of uh, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. Loved that one. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, let's uh, go with one more. Uh, yeah, I Simpsons, can't think of another one right now. But those Simpsons, are the, South Park. Simpsons. Yeah, I was a big Simpsons fan. No, not South Park. Big Simpsons fan. Um, today, top three shows uh, probably mm -hmm. House of the Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is that a, a uh, spin-off of, a... spin of Game of Thrones? It's Game of Thrones. Show. Yeah, great show. Um, let's go with uh, any Star Wars show. I love the Star Wars shows. Um, uh, Mandalorian? Yeah, Mandalorian's great. Uh, Obi-Wan was awesome. My most recent favorite one was Andor. Oh, great. I'm, I'm getting really into like Star Wars geeky <laughs> stuff now, so I'm going to cool off with that. I dig it. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and um uh yeah let's let's stick with those those are those are uh, my okay. top favorites good right choices now. good choices all right let's yeah, switch gears so. so you finish Tell i me. guess uh high school and then you go into i guess high college University? yeah yeah you, i went straight you to brooklyn college i went straight to brooklyn college brooklyn college uh spent uh five years there oh um, what'd you do there? most Mostly because I, I didn't want to start my life yet. So I kind of uh, took an additional major to stay in college for an extra year. <laughs> I started out majoring in psychology. Um, oh, always through high school, I always said I was going to be a psychologist. And I actually had one teacher who, uh, who, I, who said he was going around the room and asking everybody what they were going to be when they grew up. And I said, psychologist. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, what do you mean, why am I not? And he said, no, you're, you're way too lazy to be a psychologist. <laughs> I guess he was right. He, There's something else. So, no, he was right in the sense that I was too lazy to sit through another set of school. It just wasn't going to happen. Mm. Right. So, and he saw that coming. And I, I tried. I uh, went to college for, I went to uh, graduate school for social work, thinking that that was going to be my, uh, my great uh, contribution to society. And I, I went in for about three months. And I never came back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I left. I said, "This is not for me. I cannot go back to school. It just doesn't work." So, uh, what was what was the end goal with social work? Like working with children or the elderly, or what the was... elderly? So at the time, uh, this is a previous life of mine. I was working for a company called Ohel Base Ezra. If you ever heard of them, um, they they run uh, group homes for children and adults with disabilities. So I was running one of their homes. And my great thought was, oh, this is going to launch me into uh, you know, a career doing this, and social work is going to help me with that. That was very naive of me. Uh, you know, I think we sat down in the first So you work for an organization that you thought if you get your education in that realm, uh, you'll be able to kind of grow yourself yeah. within this career path in this kind of organization. Yeah, and I sat down in the first class in social work, and they said, let's be honest, no one here is going to ever get rich. And I was like, whoa, I'm, I'm out. out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that was the end of that um and then i kind of got burnt out with that career because it's, it's very taxing uh so i moved on and found my way into e-commerce warehousing uh okay, random... so let's let's stop the yeah. slap the years on this so you finish sure. your five years of your university and uh, then you 2006 no 2007 so you graduate 2007 and you kind of uh, start your i guess a career path and you're saying mm -hmm. it's in e-commerce logistics or warehousing yeah, it was e-commerce logistics. Um, I had just left uh, the the job at the group home uh, and didn't have anything set up to take over for it. So I got a random call from somebody who said, uh, oh, I'm looking for a guy to uh, work in my warehouse. And I was like, well, I got nothing else going on. I'm married. I need to make sure I have uh, money coming in. So let's take it. Took the job. 
Uh, it was extremely enjoyable. I found it very rewarding. Mm. Um, I, I worked there for about a year, moved on to running operations for an e-commerce company. Uh, what, was it, what, what was the typical like uh, dynamic for in that one year that made you, I guess, fall in love with it or, or get uh, connected with that? I think it was just the idea of being able to see everything as it happens, right? Instead of instead of being like the the manager running someone's life, it was more like seeing how business turned, right? I always I always had an interest in how business worked and how people, you know, made money and how they how they you know products were developed and things like that. So I was able the to plumbing see that. of businesses, especially exactly. with retail, yeah, exactly. So it really, really gave me an insight into how business works. Um, so from there, you know, I, I moved on from there after about a year or two. I can't remember exactly how long it was. I think it was two years. But you're saying they were uh, e-commerce, so they were, they were selling to a, uh, an e-commerce platform or they're selling they, on an e-commerce platform? They were one of the first people who were selling on Amazon. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say the name. I don't want to say the name, but they were one of the first people selling on Amazon back when Amazon was becoming big. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a lot of products that they were able to sell uh and they did very well uh, so they were third-party amazon sellers it sounds correct yeah they were one of the first they're not selling to amazon as like vendor no no, no. got it okay all right and uh so that took me about two years and that was a great experience uh and then i went to another company and ran the operations for them for about five years so in 2009 uh, you started in the new company you stayed there all the way to 2014 16 ish yeah 2016. about seven years almost uh yeah something like that i may have yeah. the years off but anyway it was it was a uh, somewhere in that range about five years uh and then from there uh you know that that company was uh, uh it started up as an amazon seller then it became an amazon brand uh so i got to see that whole process being developed uh you know the the interest i i, I started to see how um you know, sourcing a product worked, uh, bringing product in from overseas, all of that stuff. Um, you know, at one point, the uh, the owner of the company came into my office and said, "All right, we're going to start importing from China. So get you get figure that figure that process out." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, <laughs> all right." You know, so that was uh, well, that's kind of, yeah. By the way, that's kind of how everything has developed for me all all along. Is like someone just throws something at me and says, "Figure this out," and I'm like, "Okay," and so I figured it out. Um, and that worked out really well. You know, we, we had a whole operation importing in from China. I was able to build all those relationships. Um, talk, and, talk to us about that yeah. process and, and figuring out how to navigate that, because now there are so many like courses and like sourcing trips specifically to teach you how to do that. And if you were yeah. with one of the first third party sellers on Amazon, that didn't <laughs> exist yet. So walk us through that. Process. You touched the nerve with Lisa. She was, uh, you know, also uh, at some <laughs> yeah, point I, in a career in, uh, in a global sourcing uh, uh, solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 for me, it was literally calling different companies, sourcing companies, acting like I knew what the hell I was talking about and, you know, picking up on the little things when they'd be like, Oh, what are you talking about? And I'd be like, Oh, I'm never going to say that again, you know, until I, <laughs> until I uh, got the hang of how it works and who I needed to speak to and, you know, what exactly CBM meant and, and what, uh, what the different types of containers are. What's and, CBM by the way, uh, uh, cubic a cubic um what is it cubic 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 measurement cubic cbm i i don't remember anymore but, cubic something uh, measurement yeah the cubic something measurement, measurement, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but um but but it, it, what it is is it's the amount of product that a that a container can contain can hold That's yeah the, uh, yeah can hold so um so that that was really how it worked until i until i got the hang of who to speak to and and how the process worked and, and bringing it in and you know, and then uh, in the internal processes in the warehouse of verifying the product and making sure you have the right quantities and how to how to make claims if you don't have the right quantities. And that was always a problem for us. We always had things disappearing. Did you feel like um, you made all the mistakes possible until you, you figure it out? And once you did, you oh, yeah. compound your ability to grow there and really. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's all been about making mistakes. You know, I like to say that at some of the companies I worked at, we made all the mistakes. And then at the other companies that I worked at, we had all the answers already. Yeah. <laughs> But then you make but the other mistakes. Hire you second, you know, I, I should always hire, yeah, you know, hire after the other right. guy. Always hire after the other guy. So, um, yeah, we so, so that that uh, that took us for about five years. Uh, I left that company. I went to another company. They were an established Amazon brand, an established private label Why brand. Why was the switch you made? That you made the switch to the this company. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, so 2017, uh, you switch again. I guess the yeah. same realm. Uh, they're already established uh, uh, on Amazon. What way are they more established than the former company? 
uh, they had a thriving brand. The brand already existed. It was already selling like hotcakes on uh, Amazon and eBay and Walmart and all of those. Um, so I so, came so into hold on, it. Let me send the element. So on the previous company, it was more from the ground up for you. Correct. So you're part of that ground up experience and, and, and it was snowballing the whole environment. And here well, that's already happening. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to uh, a little more detail on this one, but uh, there was a uh, there was some level of ground up development at this second business as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so thriving business came into it. Um, and you know, my, my role was not to make the, the selling process better. My role was to get the internal processes better. Uh, so we were able to do that. Uh, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things happened there. Uh, took, uh, took, took that warehouse from being a, a, a fully manual operation to being a fully automated, well, not fully automated, but semi-automated with electronic conveyor belts and all that kind of stuff. I, I brought all that stuff in. You remember uh, how large or uh, in size the, the warehouses? Yeah. Were? Yeah. The first one way back when was like a 10,000 square foot warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one was about a 30,000. And then the last one was about a 65,000. And 65,000 uh, while you got the conveyor belt and create more automation. Yeah. With them? Yeah. Yeah. And that one, uh, it was interesting. They had a whole section of the warehouse that was um, originally a train yard. So trains would pull into it. So it was a whole oh, recessed wow. area. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it was a recessed area that they couldn't do anything with. They used to use it for storage. And uh, I came up with the idea to build a scaffolding and pour concrete over that scaffolding. And we got in a whole nother section of, of space there. It was, it was amazing. Uh, what was this? this in New York uh, cool. or New oh, Jersey? This, uh, no, this, these, um, these were all in New Jersey. Got it. That sounds like yeah, a lot of space needed. It sounds more like a New Jersey kind of uh, ordeal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so that was that was a fun project, one that I, I really am I'm very proud of. Um, and once we got all that stuff under control, uh, you know, it, I don't want to say we were sitting pretty because you're never sitting pretty, but we all kind of uh, when I say we all, I mean me and the owners of the company. We all got together and we said, uh, you know, what's the next step? Right? What are we going to do next? The next challenge. Yeah, we're selling well on Amazon. We're selling well on eBay. We're selling well on Walmart. What are we going to do next? And uh, I asked the question. I said, "Well, what about retailers? Why don't we get into retailers?" You mean in brick and mortar? I I, I meant brick and mortar. Mm. Um, you know, and and you know, they all looked at it and said, "Wow, oh, the barrier of entry is very high." You know, I, I don't I don't think we can really do it. Uh, maybe logistics will be a problem. And I said, "All right, well, let me let me do some research and see what I can figure out." And I and I looked and I found a stat somewhere that. 90% of the product that is selling on homedepot.com is not owned by Home Depot. And that jogged my thought to be like, wow, wait a minute. So if people are selling online and they're shipping their product dropship, this is the same thing. We could do the same thing. So I brought up the idea. Owners loved it. They said, if you can make it happen, let's do it. So we got well, deep in where you already with the company because you started what 2017 and what year was that when you about a year out? later? This is about 2018, about a year got later. Uh, so the company knew me pretty well and they, they trusted me. Um, mm -hmm. And by the end of by the middle of really of 2018, we had them in Home Depot, Lowe's, Wayfair. Um, uh, what else was there? Um, uh, a few others. Uh, um, we were working on Macy's and Kohl's. I was working on a few others when I left the company. Um, there were some projects that were up in the air, but yeah, those were the two, the, the three big ones were Home Depot, Lowe's, and Wayfair. Um, and using those, uh, using that company, I was able to build connections there with, you know, buyers in those specific categories. Now, I, around COVID time, so we're getting to COVID time now. Um, I started to think, you know. I've always wanted to open a business, right? I always had an interest in running my own business, but I never really knew what I could do that would be interesting. I always toyed with, you know, selling on Amazon, being a brand, but the amount of money that that took was just always the barrier for me. It was never something that I could get into. So I said, what skill do I have that I can actually sell to people? And that's when I realized that this, this, this was a business, right? Getting people into these channels is something that People, A, don't realize they can do. B, even if they realize they can do it, it's kind of like, well, how do I do it, right? Because it's not the same as Amazon, right? You're not just filling out an application and then you're getting approved and you're a seller and boom, you can sell and do whatever you want. You have to communicate with a buyer. You have to get approval. You have to show them your product. You have to tell them why your product is good for their site. You know, you have to, you have to be able to look at your different products and say, okay, your product is good for this channel. Your product is good for this channel. You know, you don't want to present to the wrong channel. So I realized that this could be a business. I said, why am I doing this just for one company when I could be doing this for hundreds of companies at one time? 
Uh, I spoke to a friend of mine who was big in business and I, I really trusted his opinion. And he said, he said, yeah, I think you need to quit your job and uh, you've got a new career if, if you can get this going. And so that's what I did. I left the company. I started during COVID company. during like uh, yeah, right after I won't, I won't say it was during, but it was, it was 2020. Yeah. It was 2020. No, meaning uh, post COVID meaning COVID happened and then you open your business. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You spread your wings. Uh, I spread my wings and um, you know, I, I felt that uh, it was the right time. Um, I wanted to spend more time with my family. You know, my kids were growing up. My kids are still growing up. You know, my oldest is eight now. My youngest is three. Um, since I've opened a business, I've been able to go to their, you know, school plays and their school mm -hmm. graduations and all of that. And I don't have to ask anyone if I can go. You know, I don't have to. I don't have to plan it six months in advance or three months in advance. Say, oh, I'm going to be out this day, or I have to rush back afterwards and go straight to work. Uh, it's 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 more it allows me more freedom to see my family and at the same time it, it gave me my dream of being able to open my own business yeah okay so you set up shop and what was i guess the first you know early challenges or my big milestones or oh there's, there's always about really the journey <laughs> there's mm -hmm. always early challenges um the first thing I did was I set up a focus group to make sure that the business was really something that was going to take off. Right. So I, I found about six people who I trusted and I uh, knew they were all business owners and I presented the idea to them and they all said, I presented the, the idea and the pricing to them. And they all said, no brainer. I would jump on that. If you presented that to me, I would jump on that in a heartbeat. So they were the first ones that I went to uh, when it was time to open the business for real. Um, you know, most times I'm sure you hear in this, if you're having this conversation with somebody, you hear that the biggest barrier of entry is money, right? You don't have money to get started. But with a service-based business, that's not usually the issue, you know? The issue is finding the clients, right? So I, I want to say I was lucky in some ways. Um, I had a few people who contacted me and said, oh, I heard you're opening a business and I'd like to talk to you about, you know, getting into Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, and it was that first one, that first one that, that, uh, that I applied for, uh, and I spoke to the buyer for and home Depot came back to me and said, yeah, we're interested. We want to bring these guys on. And that was just like the light bulb that this is going to work. This is really nice. going to work. And I, I tell people all the time, I say, if that first one failed, I'm not sure, you know, what would have happened, but you know, that first one had to be a, a approval and it was, and it worked out great. What a striking difference between you sitting in, you know, university for the psychology class and the first yeah. thing you hear, right. you're not going to be rich. I'm out. Right. I hear you, you're going to Home Depot, you know, yeah. you sit down there and like, yes, we're going to take you on. And, and the striking difference between, you know, yeah. uh, opportunity here and uh, lack of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Truth. So I, I looked at the different people in the industry, in the same industry, right? Because there's there's a lot of people in this industry. Um, they're all they're different from me, and I'll explain that. But um, what what I did was I looked at the brand, what we, what we call brand reps, right? A brand rep is a company that represents a brand and you know represents them to particular retailers and channels. Um, and those brand reps typically charge uh, a month a, a commission on sales, right? So hold and on, these brand reps work for who? For themselves or what's the... They, they work for here? themselves. Yeah, they work for themselves. Um, and they're, they're, they have the relationship with the retailer. So they go to the retailer and say, hey, we represent this brand and we want this brand to be selling in your stores mm -hmm. um, uh, or your, or your you know, online website. Yeah. And generally they charge uh, commission on the sale that they make. And this works for them because, you know, they're, they're typically doing, you know, high volume orders uh, if they're going into store, right? Buying a few, a few container loads or, you know, so they'll take a commission on that. Um, what ends up happening with that is that the retailers look at it and say, hey, you know, we're losing a portion of our revenue here. You know, we already, now it's been, let's say it's been a year already, we're working with you and this brand rep and we're losing all this revenue, you know? Do you really need the brand rep anymore? Why are they losing revenue, so to speak? Uh, because there's a commission off the sale that's being taken, right? So saying, oh, uh, they could be cheaper. So meaning they're losing on their margin. They can, Correct. you know, uh, they sell for a dollar and their cost is uh, 50 Correct. cents. It could be 40 cents margin. Got it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they look at the retailer and they say, they look at the uh, the brand and they say, you don't really need this rep anymore. Get rid of him, you know, and then the rep has to walk away, right? Because mm -hmm. the brand doesn't want them anymore and the retailer doesn't want them anymore and they move on to their next goal. I looked at it a little differently. I said, I'm not going to care about these commissions on sales. 
I'm going to, I'm going to, my business model is going to be getting you into the channel for a one-time fee. And once that fee is paid, once you're in the channel, it's yours. The count is yours. Move mm, on. Interesting. You can choose to work with us long-term if you'd like, but you don't need to. You don't have to. But if you stay long-term, it's it's uh, commission-based or, or? Not commission-based. It's monthly fee-based. Got it. Okay. Mm. Yeah, monthly fee-based. Um, you know, so we, we kind of um, were... I don't want to say we turned the industry on its head, but uh, you know we were we're trying to reinvent uh, the wheel a little bit. And other people have come now and and taken similar stances. The other difference between us and and other companies is that other companies will will take you uh, will will uh, require you to 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 send inventory to them, right? Mm -hmm. And they use their own accounts with these retailers and and companies mm -hmm. to sell the product, right? But again, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking to connect you directly with the retailer, create an account and a relationship between you and them that allows you to, to sell for the long term, um, not, not just for the short term. So let me let me ask you this. So if I'm an Amazon seller and I was able to create a, you know, establish a nice brand on Amazon and have a good presence mm -hmm. and I want to, I guess, expand into if it's, uh, you know, applicable for the category or to Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Wayfair. So you set them up with the accounts there. Mm -hmm. And you work with their because it seems like they're you know as opposed to Amazon you kind of it's all like self serve right over right. there it sounds like a combination of self serve but also relationships and knowing Correct. the right you know humans there to in order to to really get yourself in mm -hmm. and so that's on you that the onus yep. is on you to to deliver and once that's established after the races and they're good to go but if they want to stay they can stay so that's pretty much the dynamic Correct Yep you got it You got it do you have Amazon sellers come to you and say, we want to get into stores, but we don't know where, where would you recommend? And, yeah, and then what absolutely. are some of the data points that you look at to say like, okay, well, you'll fit, you know, over here. Cause with so many stores selling like Walmart target, they sell like everything, right? Like yeah. where do you start with that? But let me just clarify, you get them in to these platforms and it's digital or eventually it expands into the brick and mortar. So it, we always start with digital. Um, okay. There's always a chance that you can continue to brick and mortar. Um, it's not something that we push uh, on our side. We're we're mostly focused on the on the online. Um, I I can't say that it's a natural progression, meaning that if you're selling online, you will eventually get into brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. But there are certain sales benchmarks that the buyers are looking for. If they see them hit those benchmarks, they typically will recommend the product to go either into fulfillment centers or into stores. Got what's it. what does that mean fulfillment centers what would I, well, what's uh fulfillment centers would mean that uh, instead of it being a dropship product the onus falls now on the retailer itself to ship the product out uh so they'll buy product in bulk they'll put it in their fulfillment centers and as people order they'll ship it instead of having to ship it from so basically there. they're uh it's almost like selling it's uh, i'm comparing it to like a uh, vendor central on amazon you they, it's, they, it's being yeah. sold digitally but you send it there they own Correct. the inventory and they fulfill it once uh, there's a sale that happens so you become a vendor Correct. a digital vendor Correct. It's one P. It's not uh, vendor dropship. Yeah, got it. That's the idea. That's gotcha. Sorry, Lisa, you're asking. No, I, I was just asking, like, kind of, what are some of the first data points that you look at if a brand comes to you and says we want to expand, but we don't know where? You know, obviously, yeah. like a, a beauty brand would fit better at Sephora as opposed to Home Depot. But what are some of the other sure. things that you look at? I mean, those are, those are the, the that's obviously the main thing that you're going to look at, right? You're going to look at the category to make sure that it fits where they want to go. My favorite is when uh, people come to me and say, hey, I have a great brand. I want to sell on this place, this place, and this place. And I say, well, you don't really fit into that place. And they go, why not? What do you mean? Why don't I fit there? Well, because it's not the right category. Wait, but I'm selling so well on Amazon. Why can't, why, why don't they want my product? My product is great. They're, they're going to sell like hotcakes if my product's going to, you know, that's that's just not really how it works, right? I try and explain that. It hasn't happened that often, but I have lost uh, a few uh, few potential leads that way. Are you saying some sellers don't realize that other stores have some sort of a profile and some sort of an environment that's supposed yeah. to Amazon, which is everything store? They just don't realize yeah. there's specialty they stores. They're so used to Amazon, all the... They buy and yeah. sell on Amazon, and that's all they know. They they, realize, they think every store has everything, you know. My product sells so well; they're gonna sell millions if they just take my product in. Yeah, okay, but they don't want it. Yeah, yeah that's that's been a conversation. It's been a hard uh, hard truth to teach people. Got it. okay. So you get your first aha moment. The the light bulb, you know, uh, uh, kind of a uh, signal signals up, and then mm -hmm. you know uh, you get into business, and then what's the next? I guess milestone or a celebration point or or a disaster. Take us a bit more deeper into the experience so far in the past few years disaster i don't want to say there's been any disasters oh that you uh, were able to uh to you know uh, turn around um uh, 
a horror you know, story. You know, you they shipped a horror, two million dollars of container and it was upside down. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> none of those, none of those. But I mean, if you want a real horror story, real business owner horror story, uh, it's called over advertising. That's that's mm -hmm. what I did last year. You know, last year uh, we we decided that we were going to walk as many shows as we could and put out as many advertising campaigns as we could. And when we know, advertise, what do you advertise? We're like, like with traditional media or how do you find your target? Uh, or what was the approach when we were doing that? That's mainly, the walking, story. mainly walking shows, mainly walking Got shows, it. just, uh, you know, either, either having booths at shows or walking shows and all of that. And, uh, you know, it gets to a point where you just kind of look at your, your, uh, you know, your bank account and you're like, Whoa, where did it all go? <laughs> you know, I'm sure you've been there, you know, where did it all go? And then you have to cut back big time. So we trimmed, we trimmed advertising big time this year. Uh, but that, that was really our first horror story. We, we, that was a kind of an aha moment of like, Ooh, yeah, it sounds actually, like a learning I, curve. I, you I can realize... make mistakes in this business. <laughs> oh yeah. It sounds more like a learning curve. You, we are able to kind of realize where, uh, yeah. where's your best, I guess, target audience and yeah. the best, wealth, best place for you to really, uh, create a business relationship that will be prosperous, uh, uh, for, for many years. So I guess, what is the approach today? It's more of, um, word of mouth or social media. Uh, yeah. Know, I mean, I mean, thank God we, we have, uh, we have a lot of customers who are referring us to their friends and to their to other people they know. Uh, so word of mouth has been a, a big help for us. Um, we also have uh, a couple of, um, uh, those those messaging groups like uh, WhatsApp groups and oh and like a Telegram Telegram or, groups yeah. yeah that we that we've been uh, uh, pretty pretty um, we've we've been pretty active in for for years you know even before I started this business I was active in those groups so people knew who I was they knew my name they knew that I had a lot of experience and a lot of information to share uh, so that was definitely a help in in uh, in getting you know people in the door and getting new clients to come in. Yeah, sounds like the from the ground up, you're able to really create value, and that that yeah. that's uh, spinning its uh, ears and wings around uh, the industry, yeah. and, and creates more opportunity. Okay, so if I'm an Amazon seller, once again, you know, open a brand, is there a certain uh, level of threshold in terms of revenue uh, I should consider? Uh, you know, diversifying, or even if I'm jump starting the business, is is there a? I mean, what no. what is a typical dynamic, or what's a sweet spot? What's the best, uh, I guess, the time to to consider? Okay, so you 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 want to see some online sales happening already, right? You don't want to just come in when you've just opened the brand. I, I've had a few come, people come to me and say, "I've got a great idea for a product, and I want to get it into you know X Y Z store." Um, that may have worked in the past, right? You may have been able to tell a retailer, "Hey, I've got a great new product, and it's going to be great for your shelves." And then they'd bring it into their stores, and then you know you'd run they'd run a program with you, and if it if it worked great, if it didn't work, you know you'd have to figure out how to how to make them happy, or maybe you'd just never do business with them again. It doesn't really work anymore. They want to they want everyone to start online now, so you want to see some sales uh, in either Amazon or Walmart or you know one of the other easy. I don't want to say easy marketplaces, but easier marketplaces to get into, right? To get started with. Um, obviously, they're, they're, nothing's easy about Amazon these days. But um, but um, yeah, so you want to see some sales there. Uh, I, I usually say like six months to a year of sales. Uh, you want to see them to be pretty decent sales. You know, you want to look for at least a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a month coming in. Uh, that's that minimum. Um, I won't work with you until you're at about five million a year, um, just because. It's not worth it for me. Otherwise, um, there's also a certain SKU count level that you want to have. You don't want to uh, you don't want to approach a retailer with two SKUs, right? Mm. My the sweet spot that I found is 20 to 25 minimum uh, SKUs. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's not including variations, right? So if you're a shoe company and you have one set, one shoe, but you have sizes and colors, that's one SKU, right? That's yeah. not. 400 SKUs. So you got 25 uh, styles or product types, and then their variations can obviously multiply the the actual exactly. number of SKUs on the catalog. But exactly. it's uh, we call it an Amazonian. You got the parentason, you got right, the, and the child asin, the yep. child asin, yeah. So you got at least 25 uh, or 20 to 25 up uh, parentasins. Right, correct. Um, and so yeah, so our our sweet spot as a company, we look for companies that are between five and 50 million in revenue. Uh, and with at least 25 SKUs, that's always been our, uh, our goal. Got it. And when they kind of, uh, penetrate into these other marketplaces, typically, um, you know, they, uh, when it's successful, it goes into the hundreds of thousands of revenue or millions of dollars of revenue or tens of millions or. It depends on the brand. 
it depends on the category and depends on the retailer. You know, some some retailers will have huge amounts of success with a particular type of category, um, and others will have with different. So it's not a cut and dry kind of thing. Um, but you know, what we like to tell people is, if you take your Amazon sales and you take about five to eight percent of that, that's likely what you'll see from each one of these channels. Um, the goal with this whole process is not to find the next Amazon, right? It's not to find the next place that you're going to make so much money that your head's going to spin, right? The, the goal here is to lower the reliance on your Amazon revenue, right? There's so many companies out there who have 100% reliance on Amazon revenue. And when something goes wrong and those companies can't sell on Amazon anymore, even if it's just for a month or two or even less, even if it's just for a couple of weeks, they're so lost and their business falls apart so quickly because they're relying exclusively on this one stream of revenue. So the idea here is you, you bring as much revenue as you can from other channels. If we can get you to the point where you know, you're only relying on Amazon for 50% of your revenue and all your other channels are the other 50%, we've done our job. Nice. I like that. So okay. the collective of all the rest should be able to, you know, uh, put you Correct. in a, what you have a few legs of, of, of revenue stream and you're much more diversified and sustainable, exactly. call it brand business, uh, which is really good. Okay. So give us, drop some names, give us in your, in your, uh, in your toolbox, uh, the, the name of the, of the platforms or retailers that you can help uh, other brands, sure. uh, you know, expand into. Sure. So these days we have uh, fully Home loaded. Depot. I want this to be fully loaded. So I'll, don't, give, don't you the, it. I'll give you the whole list every single yeah, opening. One. We got 60 minutes. Go Home Depot, Lowe's, Wayfair, uh, uh, Zorro.com, TractorSupply.com, uh, Macy's, Kohl's, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Shop Premium Outlets, uh, uh, Bloomingdale's. Uh, I'm, I'm missing a couple. Best, Best Buy? Uh, no, no. Best oh, Buy. Okay. That's one Best there. Buy. Uh, Best Buy Canada, but eh, it's mm -hmm. kind of tough for U.S. sellers. Um, is Sears still alive, by the way? Sears is still alive, and I'll tell you a funny thing about Sears. Right there, this you is, go. This is this is the difference between Sears and other marketplaces that are coming into existence now. Right, I'll, I'll compare Sears to Bed Bath and Beyond. Right, Sears was in trouble. Right, they had they were going out of business. They had nothing nothing left going for them. They drove the company into the ground to the point that people don't even like the the word Sears anymore. Right, it doesn't carry weight. <laughs> Right. Wow. After the fact, when Sears was already dead, someone went over and bought the name Sears and tried to resurrect it as a marketplace. Do you see any action on Sears.com? I don't. That's see what I'm asking. Yeah, I have no idea what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I didn't even know they had one. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, there you go. See, now Bed Bath and Beyond, struggling company, but in the process of their struggle, they branched into marketplace already. Right. They built out a marketplace. They have third-party sellers selling on their site, and they're doing extremely well with it. And they're, they're putting a lot of focus into it now, obviously, because of the struggles that they're in. So they've converted it already to an online marketplace prior to the business falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. So if something now happens down the road and Bed Bath & Beyond can't continue to operate, which I know at this point is not can't, the case. They need to operate brick and mortar stores or physical stores. Correct. Brick and mortar stores or physical stores. The marketplace is still there and it will be one of their greatest assets when it comes time to sell the business. There that's you the go. difference between Sears and Bed Bath and Beyond. So that's that's. Uh, I think something uh, similar may may have happened with Toys R Us back in the day. They had all these physical stores around the country. They shut them down and they stayed mm -hmm. on the online website mm -hmm. realm. And I think yep. now they kind of rejuvenated. They were able to to kind of go back uh, uh, into you know opening stores, physical stores. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting how the digital asset or the digital marketplace can and the brand can prevail if you set up on time instead of crashing the brand and then trying <laughs> yeah, to exactly. restore it like Sears. Yeah. I mean, it's also part of the you know signs of the time, right? Uh, back in the day, marketplace wasn't what people were, were you know wasn't the next big thing. Now it is, right? Everyone's yeah, because back in the day, the Sears model and the big guns they wanted full control. They want to own the inventory. They want to own yeah. the whole thing. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, Amazon came and kind of diffused that. I said, uh, no, we'll own the relationship, but everything else we're okay to having all these brilliant entrepreneurs, uh, you know, their creativity yeah. and the resources to to you know boost our catalog into monstrous dimensions and just dominate not only that i mean sellers the, the amount of sellers has has you know ex exponentially increased mm -hmm. especially since covid time you know all these people who who quit their jobs and moved on to you know starting brands and and things like that that's starting to really come to fruition now and there's such a glut of sellers that want to sell product that it doesn't make sense not to have a third-party model anymore right you can just reach so many more people and have so much more product in your assortment and you don't have to carry it in your own uh, inventory and you know you're not the owner of the product so you don't have to worry about the the insurance issues and liability issues and it's all on the seller 
hey, it's just a no-brainer. I've been saying this for the last uh, three years already that marketplace was going to take off, you know, and it it has. And I, I it makes right. total sense, and it's it's mm -hmm. the next life for all these big brand names in terms of big box stores uh, around the country. They uh, some of them like Macy's, they have you know over 100 years of history. Uh, yep. It's a really a real way to, to, to you know progress into the future and, and keep the brand name, even if the brick, brick and mortar stores ever have you know uh, bigger challenges. Um, it gives the opportunity to uh, to have the name continue, but also. I guess maybe more importantly, kind of restore restore back to the old days because Macy's like 100 plus years ago was a great opportunity for the small brands. Yeah. And now fast forward 100 years later, it's all like big boys, right? So it's hard to get in. So now it's a reset on the digital sure. front. Here, you're a smaller brand. Come in. Here's your opportunity. Um, yeah. So well, I mean, it, don't forget, big box stores were big novelty. It was a big innovation of the of the industrial age. That's right. Now it's kind of the sure. next phase, the next chapter. So oh, that's because we're in the digital age. But um, you know that that's not to say that that a uh, you know a small tiny brand can come in and immediately become a seller on Macy's.com. There's still curation. There's a lot of curation that goes into these marketplaces, right? They they are very clear, and they've told me many times we do not want to become the next Amazon. None of us want that, right? We want to be what the Macy's customer wants to see, and we want to mm -hmm. have everything that they want to see. But, but we don't want to message everything. is I want we want to provide opportunity for new brands. Correct. They do want to provide opportunity for new brands. That is correct. Yeah. And, and and it's very hard with the brick and mortar because everybody's restrained by physical dimensions. But digital is you no know, as long as you really fit the 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 the, the ethos or module or curation, yep. explode. Yep. Go ahead. So figure it out, right? Uh, opportunity is really really there. Okay. Yep. And uh, I want to touch on the money side. So typically, sure. you know, uh, you get you dropped a few names. So if you can, on those names, if you can drop like how often do they pay? What's it you know typical like pay cycles? Uh, and, sure. Sure. Pay cycles vary uh, for the marketplaces. It's going to be anywhere between biweekly to monthly, uh, depending on the different channel. Um, they all take commissions on sales. The marketplaces, the, the commissions range from 15% to 19%. Uh, some of them have different quirks. Target has specific quirks. Kohl's has specific quirks. Um, you can get into detail with that if we need to. Um, but um, on the retail side, uh, it's always between net 30 and net 90. It depends on which retailer it is. Uh, more and more retailers are trying to push toward the net 90 side. Uh, we're all obviously trying to fight back against that because who the hell wants to wait 90 days to get paid? Um, but you know, they, they have their reasons and we get it. So, um, uh, you know, but yeah, but 30 to 90 days is usually the, uh, the, the, the range. Um, you know, and they all have their fees that they that they charge. You know, and, and when you're dealing in retail, you're dealing on a wholesale retail relationship, right? You provide a wholesale cost. They they sell it at a retail price. Uh, you know, whatever's in between those two is uh, is the profit that goes back to the retailer. Um, and uh, you know, they 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 have their additional fees that they take. And and again, if anyone wants to, well, on, this uh, is on the a, physical front or digital front? No, digital front. Always digital front. So one, digital once front. again, how does it working? So let's say I sell the product for hundred dollars. My mm -hmm. cost is. I don't know what's the typical cost. Keystone five to fifty dollars. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. So but let me ask you split? a question. So, yeah. so you, you, you. What are you saying? You're selling the product on the site for a hundred dollars. That's your retail price. Yeah. Yeah. And, and who yeah. dictates the price? The sellers, right? The third-party sellers or the platform? Well, are we again? Are we talking about marketplace? We're talking about retail. If we're talking about retail, the the vendor is the one who suggests the retail price, but then the vendor maintains control over that retail price. Got it. Right. So I'm yeah. sorry, the, the retailer so, maintains control of that. So yes, just to clarify and sharpen things up. So uh, all these uh, you know, platforms, they have, I guess, similar to Amazon, the third party selling where you kind of dictate the mm -hmm. pricing and keep the margin, or if it's more on the vendor side when you sell to them and they, they, they market it on the, on the digital front, but they keep the margin. That's pretty much the way. Right. That's the difference between marketplace and retail. And once again, the retail is digital retail. It's not like brick and mortar yet. Yeah. Always digital retailers. Yep. Yep. That's, that's what we do. Got it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much for covering that. Uh, Lisa, yeah, sure. any other questions or you want to start repacking uh, the story? I, I don't think that I have any other questions. I mean, I'm just, my head is swimming in all of this. We've been so deep <laughs> in Amazon for so long. <laughs> no, no, I think, I, I think that this is awesome. Um, I mean, the only other question that I, I guess I have is, do you, I, where are you based out of now? You had said that you were working at these different uh, Amazon no. sellers and running their yeah, businesses in Jersey that, with the warehousing. Are you, yeah. are you still in Jersey? Like, so yeah, I, I moved with my family from New York uh, I, when I was, uh, we'll go back to the, the beginning of the story. So when I first got married, we were living in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Um, and then we moved uh, when my first son was about a year and a half old. So uh, we moved to Jersey and we've been here ever since. We haven't, 
no, welcome no home, interest. baby. Welcome home. Yeah, man. No interest in going back. No interest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so my, my business is actually based out of my home. This, uh, this office that you're seeing me in is actually inside of my home. Um, and, uh, yeah, I work here every day. It's great. No commute. Is, awesome. What part of Jersey? Are you near the Katita office? Uh, where is the Katita office? <laughs> It's in northern Jersey. I think he's in more central south. No, I'm in central south. Yeah, I'm in uh, ocean ocean area, Long Branch. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that's the uh, Jersey Shore. Jersey Shore, yeah. That's ah, MTV, gotcha. the MTV show. That's, that yeah. I know. I know where that no, is. <laughs> not, not the MTV show. No, that's that's uh, that's the other side of the shore. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I didn't think that I had any more questions. Yeah, if we want to go on ahead and, and just yeah, let's package do, it up. Let's go we'll do a wrap up for it. Yeah, great. So, um, originally from Long Island, found your way to Jersey, which is a home, uh, but ended up studying at Brooklyn College uh, for psychology uh, for about five years. Graduated from there in 07. Uh, did end up doing a little bit of graduate school, but when the professor came in and said nobody's going to be rich here, decided. Never mind. This is not for me. Yeah. Um, ended up working at a you, you called it a group home organization that helps uh, children and adults with with disabilities, uh, kind yeah. of in that social work setting. Um, that was where you know graduate school had said this isn't going to be where you get rich. That was kind of your motivation, but then decided to step away from that. Ended up getting into uh, ecom logistics for one of the first large businesses that sold third party on Amazon uh, for about two years, and then ended up moving on to another more established e-commerce business selling on Amazon for about three years, helping them with growing and establishing, or I'm sorry. Diversifying and yeah, also watch, doing a yeah, diversifying and helping yeah. with the warehousing. Yeah, sorry, we kind of jumped around a little bit there. Uh, but anyway, found your way into e e-com very early and really just stayed within that, yeah. that house and all, all throughout the way built these relationships with retailers like Home Depot, Lowe's, Wayfair, Macy's, Kohl's, some of the ones that you've mentioned before and decided around the pandemic, hey, why am I doing this for one brand when I can do it for a bunch? I mean, and, and then Ecom Diversify came came to be. Was so, born, yeah. So yeah, because 2017, yeah. when you work for the more established company and there was the next challenge, they figured out that, hey, let's penetrate to these other uh, marketplaces. Right. Uh, he did it well. And then 2020, he realized he can spread his wings, uh, you know, this much into the pandemic. Uh, and that's it. We're about three years into the mix and the opportunity is there for him. Opportunity is there right. for the brands growing on Amazon. So if you're watching this, listening to this, uh, just know there's there's always the next step. There's always the next challenge. There's always the next evolution. Is. Rick is definitely uh, live evident of that. So um, thank you so much for sharing all that story. Let's uh, hit, uh, hit it to the final round, Lisa. Yeah. So where can folks learn more information about Ecom Day first if I can get in touch with you? And, and also, I know you're cutting back on shows. Maybe where can they expect to meet you this year huh. if you're deciding to go to any? <laughs> um, so uh, you can reach me at rick at ecomdiversified.com. That's the email. Um, you can visit our site, www.ecomdiversified.com. Um, you can find out lots of information there. Uh, the site is due for an update, so at some point soon I'm going to take care of that. But uh, but yeah, there's, uh, all the information is there. But please, please get in touch with me. Let me know if you're interested in working with us. We'd love to work with you. Um, and uh, uh, there's another part of that question. What did I miss? That's it. Now it's uh, like okay. a moment of truth. Okay. Yeah. Right. Moment of truth. So okay. what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs <laughs> listening out there? Uh, don't give up, really. It's, 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 if it's your dream, if it's your dream to, run, to open your own business and to run your own business, don't give up on your dream. Figure out a way to make it happen. Uh, you know, do your research, get in the, get in the, uh, you know, get in, get in the trenches and see what your skills are, what you can sell and um and and just make sure that uh, that you stick with it and that you find the people who can support you to make sure that you that you do it right the first time Beautiful wonderful, stuff. wonderful thank you rick so much for joining us today we really appreciate your time and your story absolutely thanks so much for having me guys you got it thank you everybody for listening stay safe and healthy and till next we'll time. see you guys on the next one <laughs> see you.